they carried you. These words came to me at mile 29 of the Canyon de Chez Ultra Marathon. I'd been running just over eight hours, and that was when I found myself alone. I looked around. To my left was a tall canyon wall. To my right, a dirt road, some trees and bushes, and another tall canyon wall. For the past 29 miles, I had had someone or something nearby the entire time. I'd seen wild horses, a coyote, a fox. I'd heard the chitter of insects in the trees and the bushes around me. And the birds, I'll never forget the birds. As they flew overhead, I could hear the sound of their wings, but I could also feel it in the air. A strong breeze had pushed against me for the past two hours, but suddenly it was all gone. The wind was gone, there was no sound, there were no animals, and I found myself completely alone. And it was at this point that I heard those words, they carried you. And those words would take on such a, an important meaning to me, but not yet. I still had five miles to go. Now let me take you back a little bit. I ran my first marathon in November of 2013. And I still remember crossing that finish line. And the first thing to go through my mind as I crossed that finish line was, why in the world did I think this would be fun? <laughs> and, you know, that, that feeling died after a couple weeks. And I remember talking with my wife, Leah. And I, I told her, I said, that was tough, that hurt. But I think I could do that again. I'd like to sign up for another one, but never anything further, because those ultra marathoners, they're crazy. And so, what is it about the Canyon de Chez Ultra that makes it so special that would make me change my mind? Well, this race, um, Canyon de Chez itself, gets its name from the Navajo word tsei, meaning deep in the canyon. And this in Canyon de Chez is one of the longest inhabited landscapes in America, with people having lived there for almost 5,000 years. This race only allows 150 runners each year, and it is the only time that non-tribal members are allowed in the floor of the canyon without a guide. Now, this race experience, it really starts the night before at the pre-race meeting. And here, the race director, Sean Martin, he, talks about, he talked about how he came up with the idea for the race, and then he spoke about why he puts on the race. And he does this for two reasons. The first is to help raise money for the local cross-country runners, and the second is to bring together people of different cultures, races, religions, and beliefs, and allow them to run in the canyon. He said that as we ran in the canyon together, all those differences would be gone and we'd be running in the true spirit of running. He said that the spirits of those who had lived in that canyon for thousands of years and for whom running was such an important way of life would accompany us. He said that Father Earth and Mother Sky would bless us and that each step we took in that canyon would be a form of prayer. And there was such a reverential feeling as we listened to him explain those things. After he was done, his father-in-law gave a short presentation on the importance and significance of running in the Navajo culture. And then the evening ended with some traditional music and song. And at that point, I went back to my hotel to try and sleep. So the next morning at 6.30, I was gathered with the other 150 runners around a, a bonfire as we waited for the sun to rise over the east, wall, over the east walls in the canyon. And there was a prayer offered in Navajo, and then a beautiful blessing was pronounced upon us runners. And as the sun rose up in the east, with the count of three, we ran into the canyon. Now, the first four miles were in deep, loose sand. It was difficult, but eventually I, I got a feel for it and was doing all right. And... Along my way, I saw many beautiful things. I saw wild animals. I was able to interact with a lot of, a lot of people. But at mile 16, things changed. 
It was at this point in the race that I reached what is called Bat Canyon Trail. Now, Bat Canyon Trail is about a mile long and rises about 1,000 feet from the floor of the canyon to the roof of the canyon. And it's got beautiful views. And as I began going up this trail, my legs became exhausted. My muscles were burning. I had to stop and catch my breath many times. And I was seriously considering dropping out of the race and, and calling it quits at mile 17. When I reached the top, my vision was blurry. My legs were tired. I felt like I was getting blisters on my feet. And a volunteer came up to me and he said, do you need any water? Can I, can I get you anything? I said, no, I, I think I'm okay. But I was in kind of a daze and I walked over to the aid station. And as I walked there, I noticed that there were chairs set up and runners were sitting down. They were taking off their shoes and socks. They were emptying out the sand. They were taking care of blisters if they had them. And I was tempted to sit down, but I knew if I did, I wouldn't get back up again. So I stood at that aid table for a minute and the same volunteer came up to me and he said, are you sure you don't need anything? Can I get you some water? I looked at him, I said, I really don't know. And he said, well, <laughs> let me check. So thankfully, he took off my pack. He pulled out the bladder and he filled it with water. He put it back on, back in the pack, put my pack on me, and with a pat on the back, he said, there you go. So there I went. <laughs> and I decided that I would finish the race. So I went back down Bat Canyon Trail and as I made my way down that trail, I knew that these next 17 miles were going to be so long. I probably wouldn't be running much, and I was exhausted. I truly felt like laying down and taking a nap by the trail, and I came this close to doing that. And so as I reached the bottom, I thought about this. I thought about my grandparents. And prior to this race, I had decided that I was going to dedicate this race to them. My grandfather, he served in World War II, and he saw horrible things at Omaha Beach. He was injured during his service, and he suffered with that injury through his life. And when I was 15, he passed away, and I never really got to know him very well. My grandmother, shortly before his passing, was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, and she passed away when I was 19. And as I thought of them, I thought, they never complained. They always had a smile. And if they can do that, I can do this. So I dedicated this race to them. And so the next six miles, I thought of them. I talked with them. I let them know that I missed them. I prayed with both my heart and with every step that I took. And I cried. And at mile 23, something wonderful happened. I had a burst of energy. I had strength in my legs and I wanted to run. The fog in my mind lifted and it felt like running. So I began to run. Now I was still really slow and I took a lot of walk breaks, but I was running more than I had in the past seven miles. And I ran. And then at mile 29, as quick as it came, it left. And that is when I heard those words. They carried you. And at that point, I thought of my grandparents. And I thought of the spirits of those that had dwelt in that canyon and for whom running had been a way of life. And I realized I'd been carried. And I felt such gratitude. But I still had more to learn and I still had five miles to go. <laughs> so at this point, before I went any further, I looked at those steep canyon walls and I thought back to something that I'd been taught the night before at this pre-race meeting. Sean had told us that when we felt gratitude, we should lift our heads and shout into the canyon. He said that when we needed strength, we should lift our heads and shout into the canyon. And there was power in those canyon walls. So with what little strength I had left and what little voice I had left, 
I lifted my head, I looked at those canyon walls, and I shouted, Woo! <laughs> and as I did that, my voice magnified and reverberated off those canyon walls, but soon it began to die. And as it was about to disappear, two other shouts came in from the canyon. They joined it, and they strengthened it. And I realized at this point that no matter what I thought, I wasn't alone. And there were others out there, and they were supporting me. So I continued on for the next five miles. And as I neared the finish line, the first thing I heard was my wife shouting and cheering my name. And then I heard others shouting and cheering my name. I don't know how they knew my name. I didn't know anybody else there. <laughs> but they were cheering for me. And as I crossed that finish line, it felt so good to be done. And as Sean placed this beautiful hand-beaded necklace around my neck, I walked over to Leah and gave her a hug. And I began to tell her about the race. And as I got to those words, they carried you. I was excited to share those with her. And as I got to them and explained them to her, I realized it was more than just my grandparents and the spirit of those that had dwelt in the canyon. I realized that I had been carried by all those that I had encountered in that race and preparing for that race. I realized it was Mark and Kathy, the runners that I corresponded with on Facebook prior to the race that helped calm my nerves at that pre-race meeting. It was the runner at the beginning that would stop and take pictures. And I would stop everywhere he stopped to see what he was looking at. <laughs> and, and it helped me appreciate the beauty in the canyon. And then there was Muriel that I got to run with. And there was the runner from Australia who, in the middle of the canyon, encouraged me and accompanied me as I, accompanied me as I ran through those goalies. There were the runners coming down from Bat Canyon Trail while I was dying on the way up who said, good job, and gave me a smile. There was Derek at the top who filled my pack and gave me the courage to come back down. And of course, I can't forget the runner at the final aid station who, when the volunteer offered me that cup of Coke to drink, and I looked at them weird, he said, no, drink it. It'll give you wings. And then you'll die. And <laughs> I didn't die. But I made it to the end. And it was those cheering for me at the finish line. And it was all these people that I encountered who, through their small, seemingly inconsequential acts of service to me, had allowed me to finish the hardest thing of my life. Now, I'm going back this year. And I know that I'm sure I'll be carried again. But more importantly, who can I carry? And how can I carry them? Carry on. <laughs>